everyone suddenly burst out singing. And I was filled with such delight as prison birds must find in freedom. Must find in freedom. Winging wildly across the white orchards and dark green fields. Dark green fields. On, on and out of sight. Everyone's voice was suddenly lifted. Beauty came like the setting sun. Like the setting sun, my heart was shaken with tears and horror drifted away. Oh, but everyone was a bird and the song was wordless. The singing will never be done. How do we know what they really thought when they came back after the war? When they came home. Afterwards, what it was like in our town. But you can't ever know. So you imagine. You think how it might have been. But you can't really imagine what it must have been like to return home injured. And you come back and people look at you because you're blind or limp. And no one wants to talk. To ask what was it like. They don't want to talk. It was too painful. So a silence grows. And gathers. Wordless. And voices become forgotten. It's not going into battle. It's coming back that's hard to imagine. The dead sons and brothers people wanted to talk about. They even wanted to talk to them before they are gone forever. Their children. Their children's children. And the children of those children. Look for ways to, to keep their memory, to be in touch. Books. Letters, objects, poems. We search, research, read. Millions of words people have written every year since. Always trying to find a way of saying something to fill the silence. Because a man, man or woman is not dead, dead if, if their, their names, names are still spoken. spoken. Eliza Burden Samuel Durant Kayla Fleming John Ludlow Hannon Today, Today we, we will speak, speak of them. them Speak through them, them. In, in their absence Speak in their presence On Armistice Day, 1918, Eliza Burden, who was a washerwoman. A laundress. One of many living in Pilford. I was carrying the laundry on the cart up to Coal Hill, and there's the postmaster charging out of the post office full pelt along Smuggler's Lane to the church, shouting, Telegram from London! The war's over! And some time later, going down to Wimborne, 11 o'clock it must have been, St Michael's bells began to ring and by the time I got to Rowlands Hill, the Minster bells joined in. It was as if every bell in the world was ringing. In the heart of town, at Dean's Court, home to the Hannon family for nearly 500 years, John Hannon, known to his family as Jack, was recuperating after a war wound following the Battle of Cambrai. Jack was a nature lover, a bird watcher and list maker. That morning, standing by the window, looking out over the lawn to the winter trees, he saw the rooks. As if they knew something had changed, cawing and circling at the sound of the bells. 
Mother hurried in with Maud and Harry, and we stood and listened together. <laughs> Mother put her arms around us, and then the telephone rang. Lady Forbes, I think, phoning to see if we'd heard. At his surgery on Rowlands Hill, Dr. Ernest Kayla Fleming, medical practitioner, local historian, and motor vehicle enthusiast, was starting his morning surgery. Not long home from Netley, having spent four years serving with the Royal Army Medical Corps. The waiting room was full. I was seeing a young woman. She'd just lost her husband. She'd been laid off work. She was tired, depressed, just didn't know how to get through. And then about at half past 10, the telephone rang. Thompson took the call. It was one of my colleagues from the Medical Association in London. Thompson put his head round the door and told us the news. The woman cried great sobs. I stayed with her and talked for a while. And then, when we went outside, people were everywhere, coming out of their houses as though summoned. At last, that great sound of bells proclaiming. Somewhere not far from here, Able seaman Samuel Durrant had just arrived in East Dorset from London, where he was staying in one of St Dunstan's homes set up during the war. Oh, I hardly remember where I was on Armistice Day. <laughs> I know he'd just been thrown out of St Dunstan's and I'd gone to stay with my sister in Parkstown. I used to wander about and some kind so would lend an arm to a poor blind veteran. <laughs> so, when they were having their celebrations in Wimborne, I found myself in the square, a big hubbub going on in rain, and a good bit of beer we had in the pub. <laughs> and it was good fun, jostling with the wreck crowds and listening to the bands. Look, the Drapers, A.E. Highland costumiers. I bought a fair few yards in there over the years. Remember their son, Kenneth? He was a conchy. Went off to do farm work in Devon. I heard he and his mate were stoned in the village. <laughs> For being a coward, I suppose. My son, William, wanted to join up. We were so proud. There was no way I could park the car in town, so I left it at Eastborough and joined the throngs walking to the square. We were on the balcony of the King's Head, where the photographer set up his camera trying to get a good angle. Mother Maud and Harry and we joined in the singing. It's a long way to Tipperary, it's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary, to the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly, farewell, Leicester Square. It's a long, long way to Tipperary, but my heart's right there. <laughs> After the celebration and laughter, Eliza Burden returned to work, towing and throwing across the town, the collecting laundry, washing, scrubbing, and thinking of her son. In the ranks of death you'll find him. His father's sword he had gathered on, and his wild heart strong behind him. Land of song, said the warrior bard. Betrays thee. Thy sword, at least thy rights shall guard. Thy faithful heart shall praise thee.
Back at Dean's Court, Jack is thinking how kindly the people of Wimborne welcomed him home. He thinks of the silver platter and the leather album they presented to him filled with names, sending good wishes for the great milestone of reaching his majority. He remembers the sounds of fireworks exploding over the town in his honour. Following in his father's footsteps, Jack looks ahead to what is expected of him. Hello? Come in. Sorry to disturb you, sir. My name is Eliza Burden. Uh, Dr. Le Fleming, whose laundry I do, he said, why don't you call Dr. Le Fleming, our family physician, yes. To see if you need any more laundry work doing. I was expecting Mrs. Stone to answer the back door. Ah, yes, Mrs. Stone's is poorly today, but when my mother returns, I shall speak to her about your offer. Well, thank you, sir. How are you now? Only we heard you were wounded, because we said a prayer for you. And thank God you're better. I hope you are better now, sir. Well, Dr. Le Fleming takes good care of me. My son William, he was in the Dorsets too, like you, until he was killed. Oh, I'm sorry. And I was just hear, wondering, Mr. what with you being an officer and everything, whether you might have met him. Yes, but Mrs. Burden. It's just he I didn't would... die straight away, so Mrs. Burden. they took him to a hospital. Mrs. Burden! I was not in the Dorsets. I was a grenadier guard, my father's regiment. Please. I apologise, Mrs. Burden. Sit down. Sit down. Tell me about your son. William. Billy, we called him. He almost made it through. But last October, he was badly hurt. Died of his wounds, the letter said. Not in pain. It's hard to fathom. Do you believe in this spiritism, sir? Only some of the mothers are talking about it, and I was just wondering... Spiritualism? If... Yes, yes, spiritualism. I mean, I've read articles. Mr. Conan Doyle, he writes a lot about keeping in touch with memory, you know, through seances. How a clairvoyant tries to... In fact, my mother tells of a story of a clairvoyant in a ring here in Dean's Court. In this house? In this very room a few years before the war. Oh, what happened? Well, a ring was found under snowdrops in the wilderness part of the garden. A large gold signet ring with the an onyx and the Hunnam crest. And the clairvoyant who was staying with the Lady Hunnam at the time tried to find out how the ring had been lost. She rubbed the surface and saw pictures of the history of the ring's owners and how they... Well, of course, we must decide for ourselves what we believe. That's what Mrs. Stone says. Go and see for yourself, and then you decide. But if you can't believe he's just gone, you've got to find a way to... Do you understand, sir? I do. I lost comrades in France. Do you still see them in your mind? And in my dreams, I do understand how hard it is, Mrs. Burden. I had to break the news to mothers of men in my company, and I found it was most disturbing and troubling. Have you spoken to Dr. Thompson or Dr. Le Fleming? They may be able to help you. Sometimes when I close my eyes, I can see him standing there at the gate, smiling. But his voice is starting to fade away. He was about your age. A fine.
fine young man. And a brave soldier. And a good son. My youngest Alfred, he wanted to join her. But he was too young. Like my brother Harry. And my sister Maud. Your sister? Whatever next? Yes. Thank God you were saved, Sir John. Gentlemen of the Medical Association, thank you for granting me license to share the thoughts of a rural doctor. I served for four years with the Royal Army Medical Corps, based at the Royal Victoria Hospital, Netley. With my surgeon colleagues, we did our very best to treat our gallant warriors and aid their terrible suffering. Over time, something unexpected came to my attention with regards to the procedures of war, namely the diet and training programs that left me in no doubt that these would be of great benefit to all our young men who left their urban and rural homes to join the fray. Please, let me explain. Many of our recruits came from impoverished backgrounds, from cottages and tenements lacking in basic sanitary conditions and fresh air. Hunger was a constant companion in their young lives. I decided to investigate. I selected a sample of raw recruits, many of whom were malnourished and stunted in stature. I conducted a series of medical examinations and after a six month period of daily rigorous exercise and healthy well-balanced meals, I made the most remarkable discovery. These men had grown in weight and height. Their skin, no longer pale, positively glowing. Gentlemen, what is clear is how we in the medical profession must work tirelessly to ensure this knowledge is not forgotten. Mm -hmm. As much in peacetime as in war, we need a national system of health insurance provision to provide programmes of daily exercise, healthy well-balanced meals and good advice, not just for the rich and the privileged, but for the poor. Mm -hmm. Now, it is only through government intervention that such a vision may be realised. I am determined it will happen in my lifetime. Here, here. Uh, Dr. Mace here, if he pleases, but my wrist seat never will fail. For the physic that cures all diseases Is a bumper of Warwickshire In spite of all that ale, Samuel's eyes are still sore. Someone brings him to Dr. Le Fleming's surgery. And Samuel hopes that the doctor will not sneer. Now, if you just tilt your head back a little further. Thank you, Mr. Okay, open the eye. Hmm. Just there. Hmm. Well. There seems to be some infection there, Mr. Dunn. I'll give you a dose of cream. Now, would you mind telling me how you came to lose your sight? <laughs> it's all a blur, Doctor. You like me eyes. Well, I've spoken to many soldiers in the past. Talking helps. But I was a sailor, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> how long for? Oh. Uh. 20 years before the war. A project on me. And then uh, I lost my sight August 1914. Right at the start. 
Ah, stupid accident. Go on. I was on board ship with the rest of the crew. Fiddling with a rigging, a knot wouldn't budge. And then something got loose. The boom swung about and whacked me right there. Like I'd been kicked by a donkey. The, the crew took me down to the captain, who said... Just bad bruising, Dorrit. Get better in a day or two. Except I didn't. The pain grew worse. Oh, they gave me a toilet rum, which held for a while. Then the little I could see, like a glimmer of land on a grease day, faded. And then, dark. And they gave you an honourable discharge? Yes, sir. Pension me off. And did they monitor your eyes afterwards? No. I'd soon spent all my pension and uh, ended up at Shirley Warm Workhouse in Southampton. And they took me to the infirmary because now I was unfit. Caused by the accident? Hmm. Got in a bit of a state. Used to yell and throw myself about. But this decent bloke, Sergeant Major Colt, got in touch with St Dunstan's and before I knew it, I was on the trains of that big house in London. At St Dunstan's, newly blinded war veterans spend several months adjusting to their new circumstances. They learn useful skills to read and write in Braille, to type right, and occupational training courses to help them gain employment in a new career. Netting is undertaken, and social and sporting activities are enjoyed. Medically speaking, the effects of the war are many and varied, and may cause some men to behave in uncharacteristic ways. For some, this may be physical. For others, the problem lies in the mind. Hmm. I got quite nifty at winding hemp to make nets. <laughs> but the pain in my head didn't stop. And I uh, started drinking again. Smashing things up. And how are you feeling? In my head, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I felt... Shame. Because I never got to fight in a bloody war. In the end, St Dunstan's asked me to leave. No one could handle me. My sister, she lives near here and she agreed for me to come and stay. But things like when we went into Wimborne, I couldn't stand the tuts. And oh, I bloody hated it. Oh, if they call me a brave hero, just made things worse. I thought they were laughing or mocking me. I wanted to give them a bloody good one oh, with my stick. Mr. Durrant, please, no, please uh, sit down. Hmm? There we go. Uh, oh, can't blame them. I was hardly a hero. Not the like, brave boys who tied for king and country. I was just a clumsy, stupid, blind accident. And uh, do you still drink as much? When I can get it. It's my only pleasure. Might as well die if I can. Well, you're killing yourself anyway, Mr. Durrant, aren't you? You've got to stop feeling sorry for yourself. I don't feel oh. sorry, Doctor. I disgust myself! Durrant. We have a duty to those who perished. Make the most of our lives. Now, go back to St Dunstan's. <coughs> the doctor may sneer if he pleases. But my receipt never will fail For the physic that kills all diseases Is a bumper of war in turn Oh, <laughs> 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 
Uh. Right. right. We who are left, how shall we look again happily upon the sun, or feel the rain, without remembering how they who went ungrudgingly and gave their all for us, loved too the sun and rain? A bird amongst the rain-wet lilac sings, but we, how do we turn to little things and listen to the birds? The winds, the streams, made holy by their dreams. Nor feel the heart break in the heart of things. How should I look again happily on the sun? In this room, Jack leans back into the past and forward to the here and now backwards and forwards, watching the birds wing wildly over the trees. Silent. The mansion lies within its belt of circling trees. Silent. The reeded lake. Silent. The clamorous rooks, as if they felt that sorrow, blacker wind amidst them dwelt. Jack is beginning to find Silent. his own words. The whole domain for death's sad sake. The right words for what he hasn't yet said. Slow. Steals the mist, where steals the river chill, reaching its icy fingers as to chase some lingering life. And slowly, o'er the hill, fade the last rays, where the blood-red pennons still. Dear Jack, tonight I went down the river and found the nests of two sedge warblers, one with five and one with six eggs. I'm hoping to do a bit of bird nesting this week. There's a blue tit's nest in the cypress tree and one over the stable yard door. The drive is getting on well. Last Sunday I saw a lesser spotted woodpecker having a bath on the ditch by the pond. I watched him for some little time. I've not seen or heard him since. Ever your loving sister, Maud. October, October, nineteen seventeen, yes. Dear Mum, we've marched till a half. I shall write to everyone when I get the chance. But you come first. We have come through the worst part of the town, all the way besieged by men, women and urchins who tried to sell us apples. I have not got the second battalion. Although they told me at Chelsea I had. I shall go to the third. I don't mind. There's Godman, Pembroke and Old Bill are going there.
Godman. <laughs> and Pembroke. Twenty fifth of October, nineteen seventeen. Dearest Mum, they say that we're going out soon and that the crossing will be rough. There are two sweet cats on board, a black and a tabby. The tabby slept with me all night. There's nothing much to read here, and I've not done much writing. Saw three cormorants diving this morning, and the black back gulls. Love to all at home, including the acorns and the farmyard, and I hope that the apple trees have not picked themselves. Perhaps Harry may be favoured for a letter soon, but this is not a promise. Ever your loving son, Jack. P.S. This could not go out last night, as we are still here. My diary's going strong. <sighs> there is nothing to do here. We are quite cut off from the world. Twenty ninth of October, nineteen seventeen. Arrived safely. We shall not be in the line for a bit, so <sighs> there is no need for you to fret. Talk to you, Jack, about the meeting the other night. I had hoped you'd be there. Have you read the article? Quite controversial, to say the least. Yes, well, it seems to me that the people of Wimborne just don't want to pay for a memorial. The times are hard. Things take time, Jack. I mean, perhaps there are just far too many schemes to choose from. The Church's Stone Memorial Scheme. The towns... I guess people are just confused don't know how best to honour the dead or support the survivors. Double responsibility we have there. Yes, but clearly the poll doesn't work. If 900 circulars have gone out and only 15 returned. I mean, look on the form. Where is it? There. A washout. I mean, don't people care? And what is to happen to all the wounded men? I met a Mr Harding at the meeting from the National Association of Distressed Sailors and Soldiers. Now, he referred to a scheme whereby they were going to construct a hospital where the disabled men may go and be educated. Save them hanging around street corners, I suppose. It's patronising. Yes, Harding was pretty scathing too. What about the idea of, of supporting beds for the ex-servicemen in the hospitals? There are at least a hundred. I oppose that absolutely. It's the government's duty to provide treatment. Yes, I agree. You know... A shame you weren't at the meeting yourself, Jack. Make your views heard. Hmm? You're in a strong position now you've come of age. Tenth Baronet. And they would have listened to you. Not at the moment. How are you feeling, Jack? Well, I'm well. You know, you told me. All healed. But how are you feeling in your mind? Well, I mean, sometimes at night I... Your mother mentioned she heard you calling out. At night, Jack's mind has a way of thinking what he wants to forget and seeing what he wants not 
to remember. We're there. Third battalion in reserve, watching from the hill. The great tanks rolling across, infantry advancing in their wake. Our invincible warriors, the ground shaking as they surge forward, crushing the wire, smashing the concrete pillboxes. Hundreds of prisoners taken. We're cheering, waiting our turn, thinking this is it. We are here in time for the end. By 8.30 a.m. and the first target was taken. Now, Jack, where are you now? Rain. November 20th, 1917. Ball on wood, Cambrai. Remember, Jack, Cambrai, Northern France. Of Cordite. Full smoke and crossfire. And rain. The battle is turned. The speed. The thrust. Tanks. Stuck fast in the trenches. Charging out from the wood, thousands, prisoners escaping, everything tormented, and then the command. No! No! That we should retreat, not attain our ambition. We turn, we run, the men scrambling, falling. Our oh, backs exposed, targets falling. Stop! Pain. Pain in my back. Everything hurting. And Godman. Godman and the men screaming as they die. As they try not to die. Half the battalion gone. Half the battalion and nine officers out of twelve gone. We who are left, how shall we look again happily on the sun or feel the rain? Without remembering how they who went ungrudgingly Are you there, Billy? You must be somewhere. Oh, I know the vicar said it's not right to talk to you. Because you're in heaven with the angels and it's wrong to go against his will. But you're my angel. Billy, I never stop thinking about you. All day and night. Here you were before you left. Look at you, in your uniform, about to leave. I wish I'd never let you go. I should have locked you in the coal shed. But your father said, don't be foolish. So proud of you he was, and still is.
talking like this feels strange, but good. Oh, if I could just see you, Billy. <laughs> Mrs. Stone's son, Dom, he was killed too. And she'd been to the seance. Everyone sits round in a circle holding hands and she talks to the soldiers on the other side, she calls it. And they talk back. And she had a message from Tom. Don't be sad, mother. I'm no longer suffering. And that put her mind at ease. I want to go to one of these seances. I wouldn't tell your father or the vicar. And I don't want to go against the good Lord. But if I could just hear your voice, which is hard to remember, but was deep and soft. Can you hear me, Billy? Are you there? <laughs> Her heart is shaken with tears. Her minstrel boy to the war had gone. In the ranks of death, she'll find him. Jack begins to write his way back into the world. He looks again happily on the sunny garden, watches a bird among the rain-wet lilac, and turns to little things, to words and the sounds of birds and wind. The trunk lies shattered, but the tiny shoots that spring around faith looks for later prints. Life more abundant than the life it quits. And so the beech tree for a season scathed by death's near presence, and with fears bedewed, finds strength to lift her head again. And bathed in the soft sunshine of a faith bequeathed, puts out green leaves by hope and love renewed. And in the silent meadows, by the lake, where elms and rooks and, and distant minster towers recall their lives lost and loved. And we, for their sake, turn our thoughts to say their names. Who is there? John Haddon. Are you there? Ernest K. Le Fleming. Where is he? Samuel Durant. She. Where is she? Eliza Burden. Listen. The quarterjack still beats the time in quarters. <laughs> <laughs> Every day hours strapped by chimes. The bell sounds carry over the town, the fields, the roads, the river, roofs, the windows, through the years. Through the years, the names of the dead are written near. We still, still remember, remember them in, in all, all the different, different ways of memory. memory. Remembering ourselves, and people with the same name, in the same family. In someone else's family, unknown to us, but someone who walked this way, 
in the same seasons and saw the same long winter shadows and high summers. What else can we do but listen? Look further. Look more carefully. Is anyone there? Who, Who will, will write, write our names? names? Who will speak, speak our names? A man or woman is never dead if their names are still spoken. If their names are still spoken. If their names are still spoken. Is never dead if their names are still spoken.